Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. What a pleasure to be here with you again. I'm excited about this show today. Wait till you hear who is here with me and will be on just a little bit. And this is something I'm not just dipping my toe into anymore, but I'm more and more fascinated with this conversation. Susan Slaughter is here, and we're going to be talking about how Susan guides people's psychic awareness to communicate with spirits, energetic beings, and extraterrestrials, as well as her paranormal investigator work on TV shows such as Ghost Hunters International, the Dark Zone TV, and Paranormal Caught on Camera. This show has been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards and for a Webby Award. I am listed right now in Welp Magazine as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year and recently won the COVR Award for Best Radio and Podcast Show. I thank everybody who tunes in every week so much for being on this journey with me. I've been doing this 15 and a half years this month. So it is because of you. Without an audience, this wouldn't be so. And I'm so grateful. And thanks for your comments. Thanks for your reviews, for your likes, your subscribes. I read them all and I really appreciate them. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and accessconsciousness.com. They do amazing energy work out into the world. You can become a facilitator or you can go to one of their classes online or in person. Dr. Dane here, H E E R.com. And I'm Debbie Dashinger. I teach spiritual messengers just like you how to be visible out in the world. I do this by operating as a book writing coach. I also take author's books to a guaranteed international bestseller. And the third leg of what I do is I show you how to be interviewed on radio and podcasts and get massive results. You can work with me one-on-one. -on -one. You can go to debbiedashinger.com. And if you like a gift to help you with your visibility, go to debbiedashinger.com slash gift. And I've also got online programs in all of those realms. It's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift my present to you. Spiritual messengers must be visible. This is our time. We came here for good reason and purpose. So indeed, I've got Susan Slaughter here today, a well-known paranormal expert on travel channels, paranormal caught on camera, Ghost Hunters International in the Dark Zone, who started investigating professionally when she was 18 years old. And aside from her spiritual endeavors, Susan is known for her roles in multiple horror feature films. Her duality in both acting and the paranormal have launched her amongst the horror elites. In a spiritual sphere, Susan openly identifies as a witch. She uses her clair empathy, clair sentience, and clair cognizance to help guide her in her rituals, paranormal investigations, seances, and message channeling. She speaks on these metaphysical and supernatural subjects at conventions across the nation. You can learn more about her at thedarkzone.tv and the Dark Zone app. Her Instagram handle is susanthedragonwitch.com. And later, we'll talk about her appearing at the Conscious Life Expo, and I will have those links, all of them, in the show notes. And with that, I welcome Susan Slaughter to Dare to Dream. It's so great to have you here. Hi, Debbie. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to meet you. Me too. Me too. You have wonderful energy. And your bio, I got to say, fascinating because I too am clairsentient. I too am claircognizant. I have never heard of Claire empathy before. Can you- I think that what yeah, is that? empathy is like, you know, when people I think are like they, I mean, it's just like the, I guess the formal term of saying you're like an empathetic or empathic person, you know? So, um, I think that's a really important trait. That was actually the first trait that I think, uh, I developed 
from my youth. It was more like an empathic ability to really um, feel the emotional energy and intelligence in other living things, you know, mm. humans, plants, beings, creatures, animals, things like that. Um, it made me really intuitive to like um, people's uh, emotions or even their health, you know, um, and things like that, whether they were mm. like, you know, dealing with some sort of um, anxiety or an illness or something like that. Those were the first things I was like intuitive to when I was younger and um, that I used very, very keenly on investigations um, because I think uh, it's so important to understand how a person or an ener a person or an animal is feeling, you know, um, before you interact with them, you know, it kind of gives you a little bit of an insight to like the reaction you're going to get when you, you know, start to interact with that being. So um, <laughs> that also translated a lot in the paranormal sphere when you go into a location that has, you know, different types of haunts. Sometimes there's a lot of layer to the haunts, you know, um, you could have um, a human haunt, like a human soul or spirit or energy that's there, you know, that probably dealt with a lot of trauma in their lives. And so mm -hmm. it kind of was really uh, a special ability to understand where that trauma resonated with. And then also when you're dealing with non-human energies on a layered haunt, you know, and then you have, um, you know, what could be big scary creatures that you don't really understand because they've never been human they've never been like an, an entity that you've ever encountered you know when you understand their um motivations behind who they are and what they're doing there that's also like very telling so i think that was like a very important thing to like hone in on was my empathy my empathic skills so clear empathy was really important for me um especially you know as I have graduated and grown into like interacting with um, non-human energies, you know, uh, it's like when you're in the deep ocean, you see an angler fish that looks so mean and, you know, big teeth and like crazy light anomalies on their body. Um, you just realize it's just an animal that's evolved to be that way. And that's how it lives in the, you know, crushing depths of the ocean, but that doesn't make it evil, you know? Um, and you come across a lot of entities like that when you're on investigations or when you start getting into like psychic realms. So I think the uh, Claire, Claire empathy is like a really, you know, important. It wasn't until I started honing in on um, my abilities that like, it's almost like when, like peeling away the layers of an onion where you start coming into different abilities. And I think they kind of get unlocked you know, as you start changing the vibration within yourself, as you start evolving. So all those other things like um, clairsentience and claircognizance and all that stuff, that wasn't something that I was born with. It was mm -hmm. something that eventually evolved into that the more that I started practicing with it. Oh, that's fascinating. I, I didn't know that you couldn't be born with it. I didn't realize that's something you could hone in yourself. I had it and I had no idea what was going on my entire mm -hmm. life till somebody stopped me on this show 15 years ago and said, you need to know something. And it changed my life. I was yeah, so grateful. Like, yeah. Why is Debbie a know-it-all? Because she's Claire, Claire sentient. <laughs> she's Claire cognizant. She knows the answers before you do, or yeah. like knows the outcome before you do. It's like, you have this kind of like psychic foresight, which is like, also, that helps me a little bit more in my day to day life, you know, um, it's definitely, you know, uh, it's, it's nice or sometimes like you'll get like a download that you don't understand it's like I have a thought all of a sudden in my head and I don't know where that came from, you know, you realize it's like it's actually you it's, it's your, your higher self, you know, speaking to you I mean we're all like I, like so many people in the, the spiritual community I mean I doesn't make me any special where I when I say. Um, we're all like one energy experiencing itself like fragmented pieces, you know, and so when you kind of go into the highway of that fragmented, you know, energy to its source, everybody has the ability to share and connect all this information with each other, um, kind of like the great web that we have today, mm -hmm. you know, and now we're connecting and, and it's no surprise to me that there's something like the web or social media or things like that, because I think it's within our nature to be part of this information mm, age. That's where we've kind of evolved into. 
you know, we are a hive mind, you know, yeah. in a sense, you know, where we all come from, the, like originate from this, like one source of energy. So it's no surprise to me that people, you know, develop technology to something that we're so, you know, um, that we have a deep understanding to, which is like connection to each other. And that we would absolutely need at this time. Absolutely. This planet, absolutely. Right? You cannot Especially come the evolution of like humanity and mankind. I mean, you see like, what is the web now, but nothing, nothing but, you know, monumental opinions on like major, major issues. And it's good that now we have this connectivity where we can kind of exchange all of these thoughts and mm. start to grow and, and vibrationally speaking and to evolve, you know, mm. and um, so that's one thing when I see social media and all that stuff, I was like, it's the hive mind in a three dimensional world now that we're creating devices to do this, you know, mm. and um, it's just the evolution of who we are, like energetically speaking, you know, the evolution of who we are. You've had an interesting evolution. Your yeah. mother was a Catholic, probably still is. Your father yeah. was a Wiccan. Your parents got divorced. Your mother got married to another man who was a Buddhist. And so you have this incredible soup of religion and spirituality. What mm -hmm. was that like for you to grow up in all these different spiritual perspectives? And how did that influence you? I mean, I woke up every day to a statue of like Archangel St. Michael next to my bed. And then I had like, you know, um, a, like a little, uh, I guess, little messages from my stepdad, which were like, you know, from the life of Siddhartha. And then um, it was my biological father who's, you know, Wiccan. Um, it was him that I also had a K2 meter next to my bed. So I always thought it was really interesting how I'd have this little like Buddhist prayer next to the Archangel St. Michael statue and my K2 meter in case anything weird happened in my room so that I could like validify it. So it was like all of, uh, you know, my mom, the way she reacted to me, like seeing entities or <laughs> balls of light or shadow people, she, you know, kind of was the first one. I don't know if she did this to like settle me down from not being scared where she's like oh you know those are your guardian angels you know she mm -hmm. wouldn't be like oh those are demons you know and then I wouldn't be able to sleep in my room at night so I guess she kind of like sugar-coated it a little bit and like oh those could be your guardian angels and so here's archangel saint michael who will protect you if it's not a guardian and then it was like oh you know it could be you know uh ghosts you know or you know other energies and it was just like I kind of I wasn't taught to fear these things. I was taught to kind of embrace it and like kind of uh, protect myself using like spiritual, uh, like a spiritual, uh, I guess, weaponry of like symbols and things like that. I don't know, but um, now I don't lead so much on like, you know, um, idols and symbols and things like that. Now I, I just embrace like what these energies are because I, I so fully believe that we're all connected even these other types of interdimensional beings even the big ugly monsters all of that are like you know fractals of ourselves in a, on a grander scale and so like I'm like always you know trying to understand what these big scary things are which is what I get a lot of um I get a lot of flack on my social media for because I do kind of convene with some of the darker energies because I think it's important to do the shadow work you know and so um, you know, a lot of the times these are egregores of like a, a mass, you know, um, trauma that is like being put out into the world. And the only way to deal with these negative energies so they don't snowball, you know, is to start healing them, you know, even in their ugliest form, you know, and a lot of it is like, a, you know, trauma that um, has, you know, snowballed in this energetic sense, whether, um, and I've seen it a bunch, you know, like as crazy as it sounds like, like, you know, um, projected hag energies that have come from even myself, you know, when I'm like doing a lot of shadow work and I'm realizing there's things with me that I need to fix when I start really delving into the dark side of magic. Um, that's when I start seeing like, you know, dark aspects of like my feminine energy, like kind of manifesting in these. Oh, no, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's really make sure we talk about Susan's dark feminine energy real quick. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, so yeah, it's, you know, there's a lot that that is to be unpacked there. But to be honest, like if, if it weren't for me starting off as a paranormal investigator, 
um, and coming into contact with different types of spirits and energy, I wouldn't have been able to identify um, the difference between um, a non-human energy or a ghost, something that's um, a recording within an environment for, because of a traumatic event or um, an egregore from like traumas within Can a you place. you explain what that is? Because this is... Oh. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I may have said that I've put my toe and my foot and most of my body into this fascination, curiosity, like I'm in, but there's mm. so much I don't know. So what is an egregore? So uh, initially it came from the book of Enoch, which was, um, mm. and then I, it, it was kind of like some sort of non-human angelic energy, but it has then been um, kind of deconstructed and used in the spiritual world as some sort of entity or um identity of energy that like um gets mass produced you know from multiple people's emotional projections a lot of the time the big scary ones come from like group fears so mm -hmm. like yeah. um let's say super traumatic some something awful happens i mean like um i'll use an example of uh, I was on an investigation, you know, where uh, there was a huge femicide, like in the 1600s of Poland, and I was staying, you know, femicide being a witch hunt, where they just killed right. 700 women for thinking differently against the church, right? And so imagine women being kept, you know, um, in these horrid conditions, knowing that their life's about to end, that mass um, projectile thought of like trauma, despair, um violence all of that um you know there is an energy an energetic schism that happens within each individual where they put that out into our physical realm and let's say you have 700 women doing that you know fear anxiety despair you know violence trauma and that energy starts to kind of snowball into this mass of um trauma and energy that doesn't really take shape or form and it can don't get me wrong it, it, it oh, oh, depending on the person that experiences or comes across that trauma it can shape shift and but it's not necessarily a, a living entity or a ghost per se it's just um it's like it's a mass of energy it's taken on a life energy course. that gets put out there that's why people need to be mm -hmm. so so aware when they put massive amounts of trauma into a space because wow. that has the ability to affect um a person like me that's like living in this dimensional reality if i came into a cloud of that energy um i will feel i mean well because i'm clear empathetic and like you know all that so i could feel all of that trauma in in its highest form but a person who's not aware of their abilities can suddenly like let's say move into a house that had a lot of emotional trauma and this happened happens a lot when you move in and out of locations like you know that have seen a lot of different tenants right so you have like a new apartment you moved into and yeah there's all this fresh paint new flooring it smells brand new but that apartment had seen 20 years of uh substance addiction maybe forms of abuse whether it's physical emotional or substance um, that energy gets trapped in there and, you know, let's say you're not a sensitive person, but then all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, like you have a hard day, you start turning to the bottle or you start self-medicating and it starts taking over and affecting your physical being because there was an energy within that space of a person that used, you know, substances, you know. Yeah. So you just years. moved. That makes me curious, Susan, when you moved into this new place you're in now, did you <laughs> suss out the energy in the house? Did you make sure of its yeah, history? I mean, there is, you know, there is a lot um, that is still in this location, like this new like condo that I'm living in right now. Um, it's, it feels to me like there was a lot of there. It was a heavy energy coming in. I'm not going to lie. And there's still times where it catches me off guard. I do a lot of sound healing, you oh, know, yeah. so I'll use like certain, you know, I find that some of the best way to heal these energies. Cause one thing I want to point out is like, when you see all these ghost shows or you see all these horror movies, there's always like some sort of exorcism where they could just shoo out an energy or something. It pisses it off to the point where it leaves. That's not how that works. There's like, 
you cannot, you know, destroy energy or shoo it away. You have to like transform it. You know, you have to make it conducive to the energy that you bring. So if I come in at a certain vibration, especially in a place that's been nothing but low vibration, that's going to clash with my energy. It's going to make me feel sick. It's going to make me feel, you know, um, unwell. My thoughts are going to be foggy, you know, cause it's going to, what it's going to do is going to try. And because I have a higher energy than my surroundings, it's going to try and draw where I'm at, you know? And so in doing so, it's going to bring my vibe down, which will eventually bring my vibe up, but then I'm going to be not at the vibration I came in to begin with, unless I nurture that. And in which ways I have to do, like, I I study a lot of, um, I'm a transcendental meditation person, I guess, meditationist. I don't know what what I call myself, but I do transcendental meditation. Um, And then I do a lot of uh, crystal bowl, like sound, Mm -hmm you know, um, healing. Frequency, I think is the most powerful healing. I think so. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, sound can resonate through solid matter. It can resonate through yourself, you know, and I do believe there's a a sacred geometry to Mm -hmm. these resonances that are very, very healing. You start tapping into the mathematics of energy, like cymatics and things like that. You start seeing the mapping of these energies and there are their own little footprints and that can transcend solid things like this wall, you know, that could transcend my body that maybe I'm being kind of psychically attacked by this like energy, you know, that's bringing me down. It will get all into the cores of myself and my being and my DNA because it can, it can go through your body. It could go through these solid objects. I think sound is so incredibly important for healing energy. It's not something that um, you can go in with like a prayer book and like throw, you know, blessed water um, unless you're using like, like sound and energy and, 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 you know, and certain, that's kind of the idea behind the dragon blood. Yeah. There's great oils. There's great, um, there's great incense. There's, there's tons of ways. Yeah. To clear space or bringing somebody none as powerful as sound. I I love that. Yeah. I'm with you. And it's so cool. As you're talking about this (laughs) for 16 years, you have investigated this these supernatural phenomenon all over the world, over 30 countries, which is amazing. So cool that you can travel like that, multiple historical locations. I would like to start with your experiences in ancient Inca, Incan, and my yeah, territories. Like that. Can you say, <laughs> was there anything magnificent, special, spooky that happened while you were in any of those temples? I do feel like I resonate a lot with um, the the forms of magic that, mm. you know, I mean, a lot of people don't really know this, but I do have lineage from Central America. My mother's from Nicaragua. Mm. And um, so I, I know like my, then, you know, my father's like German Danish descent. So I have a little bit of like these two different, like, like deep spiritual sides on each. But when I find that I'm like in Central America, specifically like around the like Mayan culture, it's something that resonates very deeply with me. I feel moved by it. And I started, I started utilizing a lot of their forms of magic in my ritual because of it. Um, Because I don't know. It's just a calling to me. Um, when I was in Peru, I was in Chavin, Peru, which is, um, it's not as high as Machu Picchu, I don't think, but it, there were recent excavations out there where they, um, what they thought was just a bunch of hills and mounds in the top of a mountain are actually like temples as far as the eye can see. And I did an investigation on one of these um, recently excavated temples and they kind of go underground and uh, speaking of sound and vibration and resonance, there is this giant stone in one of the temples called, they call the land zone. And it was a carving, almost like a totem. And it wasn't from that area of the world at all. Like they're still trying to figure out like, where is this giant stone from? This doesn't seem like anything from, uh, you know, the area of the Andes, you know, but here it is in the middle of a temple and one of the, the claims was that all the, the archaeologists and people that were excavating on the site, whenever they spent too much time around this land zone or this big stone, 
um, they were having visions, hallucinations, feeling sick and all of that stuff. And I was like, that's very interesting. Um, as I, I had to spend time next to the land zone to see if it was true. And absolutely the closer I got to that thing, I felt like there was a resonance that was like, I'm getting like thinking about it, just getting a little gaggy because it was like, so like almost like this super deep infrasound that resonated off of it. Like it was like something that you could, is it something hear? you could hear you no, could audibly just, like, or feel, you just you felt feel it. Hmm. like pulling into your core, like right hmm. in your solar plexus. You know what I mean? Just like right there resonating will pull on it. It would, it was making me nauseous. It was making me dizzy and people that were like kind of going against what their body were doing, especially people that are like more science-based that they're like, they're like excavating, just trying to like get their work done or like local workers, they push past the physical lesson, like sensations of being around it. And then it started getting in their minds where they started seeing things, wow. you know? And so they were seeing like what looked, you know, they were taught, well, one of the, he's not an art, he wasn't an archeologist, but he was just like a hired hand to help kind of load things in, in and out for, you know, the professionals. And so he was the one who's like, oh yeah, like, you know, I always work, you know, in uncomfortable situations. So being around there, you know, it's like, then it started getting in my head. And then I started, you know, seeing, um, like he thought he would see things like from his family, like his family there, like he would hallucinate that his children were there, where it was almost things that were in your mind started coming outwards. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's almost like it's projecting whatever it had the ability to do is to project, um, like psychically project things within yourself outwards. He said he thought he, his dog had followed him to work one day because his dog was walking around and it was like, his dog wasn't there. Like when he, there was no way his dog would have been there or his kids. Cause he's like hours upon hours upon hours away. And it's just kind of like whatever's in his mind was getting projected out into the physical and he was hallucinating. It was there in the temple with him, which I thought was really interesting. And so whatever this was, you know, in my head, I start thinking, okay, somebody put this in here because there is a way to harness this energy into a form of magic. Like, what is this doing? You know, it's like, um, like our modern magic, you know, like Neo, which ideas of like, um, Oh, you know, like set up vision boards, you know, and then, you know, kind of put that out there and, um, you know, say it and, you know, affirmation and things like that. But here they had something that if you like had, um, a way to be around it, it would project out the things from within you in like another way, shape or form, you know what I mean? Like it was, it, it was kind of like a manifester of what was blocked in your mind and it takes it out. I um, <clears throat> couldn't spend that much time around the land zone. It was incredibly, incredibly hard for me physically to do that. And not only that, um, I don't know if I, I ended up like getting really sick around the, like my introduction to the land zone. I ended up had to be taking off the case because, um, I mean, I got seen by physicians and doctors and they're like, Hey, what's wrong with you? And they're like, Oh, it's altitude sickness and all this stuff. But I had been spending all this time acclimating in the Andes and I felt fine. It wasn't until I was introduced to the lens and I spent time, you know, in the vicinity of that thing that I started getting real messed up and I had to step away from the investigation altogether because it was too much for me. Um, which is sometimes like, the downside of being like a hypersensitive person yes, like myself. Of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. It takes its toll, understandably. Mm -hmm. It we, really did. Can we also talk about the hidden tunnels and the crypts from the Knights of Templar? That I find really fascinating. Were there discoveries in the tunnels or the crypts? That yeah, the only you? thing that we saw that had, um, that we realized eventually that these were um, tunnels built by the Knights Templars was that we saw deep within the tunnel systems, like different tile works of, of their emblems, you know? Um, but nothing was ever really found outside of the, the crosses that they would wear um, in the tiles around systems. To be honest, the underneath the, it went underneath the Danube in Serbia. So we were in Serbia, we went into these like tunnel systems that um, as, you know, I don't think these tunnels were supposed to be like, uh, long lasting tunnels because they started caving in. And the reason why we went there was not so much to investigate um, the goings on of the Knights Templars. We do have evidence that they did build these um, 
tunnel systems that went underneath the Danube. But um, what happened was there were other people, the people who were excavating and discovering and going deeper and deeper, trying to see if they could find anything from um, the Knights Templars, if they left anything but behind other than emblems and, and you know, not sigils, but like um, crosses and things like that, that they are, mm-hmm. that was obviously one of their embl- like emblems. The people that were going into those cave systems eventually got um, cave systems like fell in on them. And um, some people have died, you know, like a lot, like awful deaths of like starvation and they just got like holed in under the, so it was like, had a lot of this haunt vibe to it because Mm. people that went into it never really got the chance to come out because it was Mm. such a dangerous cave system. As much as I wanted to go in certain parts deep under the Danube, it was just too dangerous. Um, So we would, you know, I remember going in, they were like, okay, well, if there was something to cave in on you, this is how you would survive because it would take um, weeks for them to like get to you. So how do you survive for like six or seven days, maybe two weeks, you know, underground and pitch black with like only roots and like barely any water to survive on. So it was kind of more like a spooky tunnel system. And I never really uncovered too much about the Knights Templars in that one, Mm -hmm. but it was really interesting to kind of walk in the footsteps of where they had once been, Mm. you know, and um, understand like a lot of the effort that they put in to build these like secret little access points from one end to the next, you know, and on their whole, you know, crusade, I guess they were also some of the first people to try and like spread enlightenment in their own ways, Mm -hmm. you know, and bring religious ideas that weren't so much in alignment with the church, you know, but Um, but also it just, it's funny how uh, the whole world has been shaped by ideas of spirituality, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, I I hear Susan, like the word out there is that you will do anything to get the story. Like you're beyond adventurous. Like I will do whatever it takes to get evidence of the paranormal. So what is the scariest, maybe the stupidest but the scariest, spookiest, craziest thing that you have done to get evidence and what happened. I've always been the person that's like, let me spend the night, you know, like when people would um, like wrap up all the gear, especially because we were working on television series. So like, you know, our field producers, the story producers, our camera guys, our audio people are going back to the hotel, you know, for the night. And I'm just like, no, I want to stay, you know, uh, here and well I'll tell you one of the scariest places I spent the night was in an oubliette which is um it's a type of torture chamber um it was in Nottingham when I was invest- investigating the galleries of justice and um I had to repel into something called the oubliette which essentially is a giant dark pit that you can't claw your way out of or climb out of there's nothing in it and so how they used to like sentence like petty thieves and adulterers to death was that they would just throw them in the oubliette and oubliette in French is means to forget. So essentially they would just throw people in there and that's it. There's no way to get out. There's no, like you're, that's it. You're going to starve to death in there unless you eat each other is kind of like the dark story of the oubliette. And that was what people would get for stealing loaves of bread on the street. You know, like it was messed up. So a lot of children and women ended up in the oubliette Mm -hmm. and um I spent the night in there it was actually just strangely there was no sound that reverberated off of the dirt walls it was so spookily quiet the amount the the quiet the silence was the the most deafening part about it all and because you're so deep underground and the 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 entrance to get in is like only about as big as like a ring light. You know what I mean? Like they would throw you in there and you couldn't get out. And uh, you're just in this giant cavern and there's no, I, like my walkie talkies didn't work in there. Like there was no way signal was getting back and forth. It was just kind of like, guys. How remember? did they check on you? I was like, it was a time thing. You know, it's like, I had my watch with me and it was like, okay, we're going to, someone's going to come and check on you every three hours <laughs> and three hours in the oubliette no. felt like an entire day. It was no. nuts. Um, yeah. Another place that I stayed in was, I, I mentioned to you about like 
the idea of the egregores and stuff about uh the, the femicide that happened in Poland, I was staying in uh, like in an old, old medieval castle. Um, and they had a basement that they outfitted to like keep and torture witches in. And so I slept in that basement, <laughs> you know? Um, so it was, yeah, definitely. I've spent a lot of time in some of the darkest places in the world, like figuratively and literally. Um, and then I think the other thing I've had to do, this one got a lot of feedback, especially like me starting off and, and people not knowing like who I am and what I do. But um, when I was in uh, Belize, I went to investigate uh, these ancient Mayan temples out there. And one of the things I wanted to do was involve ritual because, um, you know, ritual is so close to my heart. It's what I do to help me manifest like. I'm all about that, you know? And so um, when we were talking to one of our clients who was a tour guide there, he said he, because he's like a descendant of the, the early Mayans that, you know, lived mm. in Belize that built those temples. He said he went in there to do a ritual to appease the gods, the Mayan gods. And um, that's when he started getting all this haunted activity. And so I was like, all right, well, let's see if we could do that ritual you know, and he's like, but you understand it involves bloodletting. And I'm like, that's cool. Like we could do that. You know, I don't mind. So um, I think that, you know, like I, I definitely take on a lot of different cultural aspects to ritual and bloodletting is something that I definitely do practice. I prefer that than like animal sacrifice or things like that, you know, which, you know, I grew up in Miami We've got a lot of Latin American cultures out here. We got a lot of Santeros, people that practice voodoo, hoodoo, all of that stuff. And animal sacrifice is part of their culture. Mm. Um, and so, although I draw the line at that, because to me, as like, if I want to manifest something for myself, I feel like the offering needs to come from me mm. and within. So if I can offer my life. <laughs> so for you're it, saying the bloodletting comes from you? Yes. Wow. So I did a bloodletting ceremony in an ancient Mayan temple using original artifacts, which was like probably one of the most amazing things I feel like I've ever done, where I had like an obsidian blade that was carved mm. by Mayans thousands of years ago. And I cut myself open and I bled into an old vessel that was thousands of years old using, you know, um, old like incense and things like that. The fact that I had the opportunity to use those objects was yeah. so incredibly profound for me. And I don't think people understood that, you know, they're like, Oh my God. Like I got a lot of flack online big time. Like, I almost got like canceled, you know, or they're just like, my daughter watches you and looks up to you and she's mm -hmm. a cutter. And then all of a sudden it became about mental health. And then I was like, uh, this is not what that is, you know, but I understand your concern, you know, um, you know, this is an ancient ritual used by mm -hmm. Mayans. And I had the opportunity to do it using like legit artifacts, you know? And so for me as a witch, like I wasn't going to pass up that opportunity. And we did get some really interesting, um, uh, really interesting evidence from that. Lots of uh, audio evidence, uh, disembodied voices and things like that started happening around the temple when we were investigating. Anything um, that could be understood? Absolutely. Yeah. The, we heard a voice, um, like speak the client's name outright saying that it's not Pedro. That was like what it said. It's not Pedro, which I thought was really interesting because it was like, um, like, why do you speak English was another thing. Like, you know, you got to pay attention to, it's like, um, do these energies know how to speak different languages, you know, when they're not necessarily human incarnate, they yeah. can like to, to say things. So I would understand because a lot of the times if we get, um, EVPs, you know, uh, there will be, what an, is like, that? An electronic voice phenomena. So it's when you hear a voice that you didn't hear with your ears get recorded mm -hmm. on a device. Got it. And so when we hear this, you know, voice, uh, a lot of the times we could tell what type of entity it is, if it's like a ghost of a person, because, you know, being around the world, not all ghosts speak English. You know, if you're in France, they're going to be speaking French. If you're going to be in like, you know, um, Poland, they're going to speak Polish, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I uh, could tell if it's a human haunt based on the language they're speaking. Because if I'm in that country and they're speaking that language, 
you could tell by the inflection, the dialect and the language mm -hmm. that these are in fact uh, human spirits, you know? But then when you're in another country and you start getting things that will speak to you in your language, that makes, that you know, like kind of piques my interest is this some other type of entity that knows how to speak, you know, for me so that the message hits me so I get it you know and so that was an interesting occurrence that happened at a Mayan temple you know where um and you could tell the the inflection the vocalization sounded like a foreigner speaking English how interesting you know wow like that with an accent but nothing that I could understand like you know I'm very keen on accents too you know mm. like I can understand like if a person speaking to me in English they're from another country I could usually peg what the accent is you know um and so that was an interesting thing that happened was having entities having to change their language or dialect or something just to communicate with you through devices. So that happens when we were at the Mayan temple after we did the bloodletting uh, ceremony. <laughs> yeah, In crazy. your list of all of what you are, it also includes reptilian, which really caught my attention. Why reptilian? Do you identify as a reptilian starseed? It's so funny that you brought this up because I had this conversation with Linda Moulton Howe last oh, yeah. year. Mm -hmm. um at, at conscious life expo um with a friend of mine named uh melanie who also she does like past life regression on star seeds to understand like their origins really Beautiful. cool but i the thing is that i find and i like in my handle i'm susan the dragon witch i definitely identify with reptilian types of energy but i find that they don't necessarily like I got in this like not a, it wasn't a heated argument but i was kind of like on the sides of the reptilians talking with linda moulton howe who has a very you know different view about reptilians than i do where i find that you know reptiles in general are some of the most um uh, like evolutionary uh just advanced types of creatures where like they have evolved and evolved and evolved and evolved and even in order to like um, no matter what environment you put them in, you know, like if there's enough of them, they will learn to evolve and they shed their skin. There's like so many things where it's just very, um, there's a very transcendental like, uh, situation with them. And plus I love snakes. I've always been drawn to them. Like I went to school with, um, for, uh, zo zoological studies and then I branched into herpetology and then I started handling snakes out here in Florida. And I started like finding myself uh, saving a lot of snakes that were considered dangerous. Like people, you know, I don't know. I felt like a kinship to like serpentine creatures and, and iguanas and like reptiles in general. I just have like a real understanding. And I find that when talking about my empathetic abilities, when it comes to animals are very strong with reptiles, <laughs> you know? Well, that's and so, beautiful. And I have to say, you know, it's, an, it's like saying all doctors are bad. It's impossible because if you know anything about different planets and especially reptiles, uh, reptilians do get a bad rap. And when I first started getting into ufology, I got corrected very early on by somebody who said that's actually racist because I, yeah. I, <laughs> an assumption that they were dangerous and man maniacal and our president was a reptilian and all sorts of stuff. And this is years and years ago. And they corrected me and said, no, no, there are amazing, beautiful reptilians out there. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's like good lawyers, bad lawyers, yeah. good actors, bad actors, all of it. So I, I love that you identify and that you feel on this planet, the kinship. Yes, our house. We have little lizards everywhere. Me too. I, I they like them. they they come to me. They 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 find me. Like I I come across like and like reptiles in distress very often, and I rehab I rehab mm -hmm. them. Like one of my <laughs> earliest uh, encounters with that was with like out here in the south. We have water moccasins or a type of viper, mm -hmm. like a cotton mouth viper, right. and um, 
you know, kids were like beating it with hockey sticks on the street. And I was just so appalled by it. And they're like, it's poisonous. Don't, we got to kill it. We got to kill it. And I was like, Mm -hmm. they went and found it to kill it. It was almost like this whole thing. And I, I straight up just the, the boys in the hood were like, so incredibly like, that's actually the first time people I think got really scared of me was when I grabbed this Viper with my bare hands. I had been like 10 years old and I put it in a cooler and I kept it like, it had a broken back, you know, um, but I rehabilitated, rehabilitated it over a while. My mom actually was cool with me keeping a Viper, you know, um, to, to rehab it until I got it strong enough and released them back into the wild. And um, I, be ever since that day like people have been giving me like oh I have this snake it's getting too big I don't know what to do with it or oh you know I have this bearded dragon that's like sick with like a respiratory issue and like I've just been taking all of these like reptiles like the reptile whisperer over here just rehabilitating them understanding that these animals can thrive in their environments they're very 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 smart and aware um specifically lizards I, I mean I still I have a snake right now her name's Clementine and I use her as like a like an emblem in my rituals you know so mm-hmm. whenever I do manifestation work and I do my rituals she's kind of like my familiar and I will wear her as I read you know my intentions I use her sheds to wrap my you know spells in and you know mm-hmm. she's very much a part of like you know, I've always had snakes and reptiles in my life and they've always been a part of like the magic that I work with, you know, that I always bring reptilian energy into all of my magical works. So it's just something I'm attracted to. And I really feel, um, it just speaks to me and I feel like they kind of see me people like, Oh, reptilians are like slimy and cold and all this stuff. And I'm just like, I don't think so. I don't think so at all. You give the, like, they are so reciprocative, reciprocative. <laughs> um, <laughs> when you give them the right environment and they, you know, like I, it's just, it really is like, you know, when you, anything could like, at, like those specific animals can thrive anywhere, you know, and they've evolved, you know, and they've lived on pl- this planet, like longer than human yeah. beings have, you know? And so when I feel like a kinship to it, I feel like I do have like, maybe like some spiritual ancestral energy as crazy as it sounds. To like no. dinosaurs, <laughs> you know? No, not to me <laughs> at all, by the way. And if you've ever had a star seed reading, and I have, I have from the inception of my soul had a reading and it's life-changing and you can never look at the galaxy and other beings as them and us again, we yes. are them, right? So no, this makes total sense to me. And that the dinosaurs were on this planet, one of the originals, yeah. I mean, the reptilians came here too in various forms, but yes, yeah. no, I, I so get it. Yeah. And I think there is like maybe a little bit of a genetic manipulation that had happened because absolutely. of actually thresholds coming in, you know, and the reasons why, like, you, you know, like, and I always argue that, you know, the dinosaurs were on this planet for like millions of years. We've only been here for like, that we could understand for maybe like, hundreds of thousands, you know, imagine that the psychological evolution that these animals or beings went through, like maybe they got to the point where like they, they could communicate in a way and understand each other in a way in such a very like biological way, but also in a mm-hmm. very telekinetic way. Yeah. I, I can, I just wish I knew like how their brains worked, you know, where it's like, maybe their brains were so small because, you know, they had evolved different things to communicate or to think with, you know, like maybe they're more like a, like how snakes have the ability to see heat, you know, like they just have a different ability. Like humans need larger brains because we use our minds to adapt to living on this planet. You know, like we had to come up with, you know, shelters and clothing and cooking food so that we could adapt and live and survive in a hostile environment. I don't really feel like human beings like really evolved on this planet. I feel like we kind of came here and we had to learn. And in order to learn, we had to have bigger brains, you know, Mm -hmm. like to, to, and we don't even use our whole brain. Imagine when we learn to use a hundred percent of our mind, you know, we only use what, like 10 to 12%, like if you're a genius, you know, well, but then there's the junk and and the, the stuff we don't use. And you have to, you know, there's been a lot of theories about that having to do with 
extraterrestrial information and star connection and so forth. Uh-huh. So I'm listening to your all your curiosities and uh, I'll I'll say this piece and then I'll ask the question later, but you're going to do a lot at the Conscious Life Expo. You're also offering a seance with Susan Slaughter. I think you have three sessions over the weekend and these yeah. are two and a half hour intimate experiences. Yeah, yeah, they're serious. <laughs> Has anybody I mean, I, ever I, they might go over, I'll be these? real. Um, seances are, are not a short experience. Well, because I was reading about it and I was reading how you have an inner circle yes. and then you have this outer shell. So folks who don't want to participate, but want to watch. And I thought, well, what if somebody freaks out? What if well, something the happens? That, and Even if you're in the outer circle, okay, just because you're not hands-on, you're not touching like the tools and things like that. There are still messages coming in for the outer circle. You know, that's happened before many times, you know, like the reason why I keep an inner circle is because I, you don't want the table to get crowded. You don't want too much energy coming. You, you have to have like your strongholds because I never during a seance touch the items myself. Like um, mm-hmm. I definitely use Ouija boards and pendulums and things like that. And I'll bring in other tools to amplify um, psychic awareness for my seances but the readings are for the entire room. And so sometimes even though you have six people at the table, you know, hand on the planchette doing the Ouija board sessions, there are going to be messages for people on the outer circle coming in as well. Uh You know, so it's not just for that. You never know the messages and for who they're coming in unless they're actually being written out. There have been, who's this message for? And they'll write the name like, oh, this message is for Ashley. And then Ashley's on the outer circle. I'm like, okay. So Ashley gets to ask the questions. Like, who are we speaking to? And then the people on the inner circle get to move the planchette and stuff like that. So um, I also do a gallery reading um, using uh, more modern tools, you know, something that I discovered as an investigator. Um, And so I don't want to give too much away, (laughs) you know, But they can um, come, but you're also going to be speaking there. You'll be on panels, right? So yeah, people can come. Yeah. So folks, you can see her in person. You can also, if you're somewhere in the world, I say go live. Like, you know, it's mm. amazing to go. It's worth the weekend. If for yeah. some reason you're somewhere in the world and you say, I just can't, then live stream it, you know, pay to live stream it. It is so worth it. It is the most amazing from the moment it starts to the moment it ends with well, Friday, midday to Monday evening. I mean, you'll get filled for a year, really. And I'll it's have true. the link and in the show like notes. If you're feeling a little empty, like your bucket's a little empty, you go to Conscious Life yeah. and you, you, you leave with all these energetic tools and, and information and knowledge to like transcend where you're at at that moment, you know? And yeah. so- Speakers like yourself, you know, there's so every year there's different people. They keep bringing in new blood, which I think is great. And then they bring back some of the old, you know, besties, but it's the learning is phenomenal. Yeah. So cool. Um, and I will see you there for sure. I know I'm excited for that. And of yeah. course, I would love to have you at the seance. Like you're invited to whichever one you can make. I really, um, I felt you were going to say that, which is. an honor and hilarious and terrifying all at once but I will take you up if you can promise that nothing will happen to me there will be no attachments and I hope that something happens to you and that's the thing like I do that's why that it's not just a cut and dry seance there's a lot of energy working that we do together as the group to like amplify our energies and our psychic awareness and then we have a closing ceremony which is so important so that way you can like shed away the energies so that they don't become sticky. Um, and, and to, to be honest, it's all, um, I like to call it an invite only seance, you know? So it's like, you can only bring whatever energy you want to speak to, you know, and then that's in your own arsenal for your own, you know, knowledge you come in and you want, you know, that's why I say it's like, you could come and bring, if you want to like talk to something, like extraterrestrial or something angelic or even demonic i think that demons get a bad name you know but you or you even want to like talk to your higher self and get some insight to like your evolution you know Mm. and things like that so it's it's a very um well-rounded thing where it's not we're just not talking to ghosts it's a conversation 
um, with so many different types of entities that we include. And, and, you know, and, and yes, we've had departed loved ones come through, you know, mm-hmm. very strongly as well. Um, last time, actually, I did a seance. And it's like, if you're in the room, like, it doesn't matter whether you came to participate, there was a woman that was, a she was a camera operator for the live, for the seance. And she got a message through for her. She wasn't participating. She's like, hey, nice. I just work here. And, and then something came through for her. And, mm. and that was a profound moment for her, which was mm. a beautiful experience. The idea, to be honest, the seances are, are very emotionally heavy experiences. Mm. They're not fluffy at all. There Can you explain where- briefly about Victorian era spiritualism and the term seance? So seance is like another French term. And it's like to see, to see into the future. And Victorian era spiritualism actually gave it a really bad rap because you had a lot of, you know, people like the Fox sisters who were using seances or people's grievings, you know, of lost loved ones and created this whole charade around spiritualism and, and all this like faux content, so to speak. And they became performers. They were famous for it. I mean, it's, Mm -hmm. you know, um, it, it, it was, it, it was something that was rooted in the reality of that you could connect using your psychic awareness. But then a lot of the seance became famous because of all of the kind of, you know, sketchy folks in it, you know, especially when it came to spiritualism in the United States, like the Fox sisters. And, um, you know, Houdini was a big naysayer against, you know, seances and things like that, because he he saw it for himself and knew that it was like kind of bollocks. But to be real, um, if you go way back into time, not just like Victorian era, you know, spiritualism, you start thinking about the works that like John D did, where he started doing like, you know, real research on how indigenous people connected with their ancestral energies using things like um, scrying and, uh, you know, like black mirrors or obsidian mirrors and things like that. And he started understanding, you know, like, oh, you use your own psychic awareness because you have the ability within yourself to connect with other types of beings, you know, Um, whether they're gods, whether they're goddesses. That's why, you know, you have these middlemen, spiritual middlemen, like uh, shamans, you know, and witch doctors and older, you know, um, religious, you know, uh, indigenous practices. Uh, and, and that's kind of like how I gravitate towards the seance. And I do use the traditional tools like a Ouija board and pendulums and things like that, because it's uh, using a tangible thing. We, we live within a physical realm. And so that's kind of like what um, witches do. We understand that you can use physical objects to uh, hone in your, your ideas to manifest in, into other realms. Like, so, so things tend to be like emblems for what you want when you do rituals and, and, and the Ouija board is an emblem of communication, you know, that's been like, if anything has its own egregore attached to every single board that's ever been made because everybody looks at a Ouija board and says, that's how we talk to ghosts. That's how we talk to spirits. And so you're already manifesting the fact that that is exactly what it does. And so you're using this tool to, uh, to, to hone in and communicate with your higher self who then brings in all that information. So I think there is a bit of a misconception about how Ouija boards are used. Um, they think that, oh, like, um, you know, the ghosts are talking through you, but to be honest, I mean, yes, they do, but you are the the messenger in that situation. And yes, you do. The only thing that gets a little hairy at times, um, it can lead into situations of possession because you become the vessel, you know, of communication. So energies can hop in to you. But the thing is that doesn't necessarily need be to be a bad thing when you start identifying it, and that's why conscious life is such a great place to do a seance because the people that sit at the seance table are, um, they understand the law of one where everything comes from this great one source of energy and we're all fractals of that. Mm-hmm. So they're the best people to do a seance with. 
um, because A, they're hypercharged, hyper aware. Everybody that goes there, I think, is a little bit on an intuitive scale one way or the other, you know? So the seances there end up becoming hypercharged and the people are not scared to connect with other types of beings because they do so in their own personal ways, you know? And so you have a lot of like real soldiers at the seance table, the ones, and that's why people are not willing to, to connect with, you know, the tools and, and become vessels for the information. They're more than welcome to still get to reap the benefits of that. If they go on the outer circle, you know, mm -hmm. they're still all part of the seance, but they don't have to get in on the energy and become conduits, you know? Got it. Wow. That's awesome. Thank you for the invitation. Cause really that's an opportunity for me to step up and do something that typically would scare me to do. I'm mostly afraid of attachments. Like I don't want, I didn't, you know, somebody would have but to clear you have, me. Of you have attachments all the time. You have like ancestral attachments, like the, the, the clear cognizance, the, the, the messages that you get, the, the insights that you have or come from these energies that you are tethered to, you know? And so you're always going to have these attachments and, um, you know, and I believe that it, you know, you'll, but you I mean, know what I mean by that. I do, but you, you're scared of like a scary ghost attachment. She's going to come out of your television looking like the ring and like, <laughs> that's what ghosts are, <laughs> you know, like, that's what, like, and that's I've seen good. shit like that. Let's be real. Like I have, but you know what, that's, what, those have been reflections oh. of myself when I'm like doing shadow work, yeah, you know, totally. so the scary things that you see is because there's something within you projecting that, you know? So then that just shows you, you have to work on those aspects of yourself. Yeah. Because so I'll come work uh, at your seance for sure. I'll come. And nothing, and that's a lot of light. Only. It's an invite only. So you're going to be able to bring one spiritual guest with you as that's what I call it. Mm. And then um, that it, that's the only guest that will be able to connect with you. So you're, I'm not going to bring in, a bunch of people's energies into my seance without that's why I call it invite only oh, cool. you get one okay. your plus one is your plus one spiritual guest and that's the only thing that could come through during the seance so you have to pick wisely yeah I really and then know. see yeah and see what comes through for you and and we do a whole little ritual around picking your spiritual guest so that's like how we talk so it's only invited guests um, on the inner and outer circle and do everyone you live stream one. this. Do you know if they live stream it? Um, we did last year. That's how the camera girl got her. And I made her, that was another thing too. It's like, if you're in the room, I don't care if you're just working, you have to have your invite only. Like, that's how I, I don't care if you're monitored or you're doing monitors or you're dusting the lamp down there, you know, like you are, you have to have your spiritual guest because if you're, at, if you're physically in the room with us while this is happening, I don't want open doors for, um, you know, yes. randos to come in like random energies. Um, it's an invite only type deal. And so we, I have a ritual around that and that a way that we open that in the space and a way that we close that in the space. And, um, yeah, it takes a long time. And you know what? That time flies like two and a half hours felt like 15 minutes last time. It was nuts. Like mm -hmm. with the amount of information we were getting. And so that's the reason why there's like, okay, you can't just, cause last year I only did one seance and I guess it had made its way, the rounds back to, you know, the, the heads of conscious life. And they're like, okay, no, like people want to do this. And because I don't, I keep it a very limited because I don't want it to be a giant. It's an intimate thing. You know, people get really vulnerable at these seances. You know, you have a lot of loved ones coming through mm. facts about things and deaths and stuff like that, that it's like, you know, it's more, you got to create. I'm a there. Space, I'm already there. You know? I'm in, I'm, I'm months and months in the future. I'm there. <laughs> I hope so. I Pick one and, and you're there. Totally. So. Oh my God. Thank you for the invitation. I, I had already intuited you were going to tell me that and yeah. So I'm a hell yes. <laughs> Yay. And Susan, this is Dare to Dream. You are the one of the most adventurous people I've met in a really long time. And I think that's cool. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you too for that energy. What are you next, Dare to Dream? What are your future dreams and goals? Where, where are you going, girl? I mean, to be honest, like 
I kind of, I'm already like on that path a little bit, you know, like I wanted to be a person that follows their spirit and inspires other people to do the same. You know, I want to inspire people to be more spiritually aware of themselves, of each other and have a little fun doing movies and stuff, you know? So I'm there. I'm, I'm, you know, if anything, I could, I could only just get bigger and bigger in those spheres. And that's all I, that's all I could ask for. Do you have anything coming down the pike on any of the TV shows that you're on that you're especially looking forward to that you've never done before? Well, <clears throat> as for as TV shows, I've already finished and wrapped season five of Paranormal Con on Camera, which is airing right now. So all the new episodes of Paranormal Con on Camera are on Discovery and Travel Channel. And um, when I'm also in Los Angeles for Conscious Life, we're going to be doing another Dark Zone event. Okay. So that's an investigation that we're going to be, um, I can't really delve too much in it because we're still talking with the location, but that will be coming up soon. And, you know, um, I did a movie in Chicago uh, a couple months ago. And so that's going to come out. It's called um, Weekend Dead Away. So if you see it, <laughs> um, <I love> that. <laughs> yeah, it's super uh, campy horror gore stuff, which is, you know, just, just good old fun. But uh, yeah, I get to do a little bit of everything, you know, and so I'm just looking forward to the Conscious Life Expo is kind of what I'm really focusing on right now. The seances take a lot out of me mm -hmm. and I have to put a lot into them and doing three of them is uh, is quite a task. So um, I will be doing that, getting my energy right for that. And that's going to take a long time too. you know, in order for me to go into a seance, I have to make sure that my demons are good. You know, I have to do a lot of shadow work. <laughs> so I'm trying to make sure that I am sitting in a place of like light and bright for the seance. So anything that's got me feeling down, you know, like, um, you know, like living alone for the first time in my life, things like that I'm working through, like to be real candid, like having um, a space to sit comfortably in for a while because I was kind of a nomad and um, yeah, just working on that. So my big thing right now that I'm doing is getting back into a space of like centering myself, doing some shadow work, um, and getting my energy at a vibration that can like be utilized correctly for a seance. And there's a lot of internal work that goes into that, you know, and people, you can't just like set up a seance, you know, it's a whole vibe, <laughs> <laughs> literally. All right. So people can find you on Instagram at Susan the Dragon Witch, all one word, Susan the Dragon Witch. And I want to thank you so much for coming on the show today. This has been amazing. Really. Thank I you, Debbie, it. for having me. And I can't wait to meet you in person at Conscious Life Expo. And, and you could be on the inner circle. You could be on the outer circle, whatever you're comfortable with. Just be there to witness it. I think you'll enjoy it. I'm in. I'm in. I'm a hell yes. Yep. <laughs> and we will be well protected. I'm bringing an army of angels. It's going to be awesome. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So thank you. Bless you. I can't wait to meet you too. And I end today's show with this quote from Thomas Jefferson. If you want something you have never had, you must be willing to do something you have never done, which is actually hilarious because I just agreed to do a seance. So there, you, there you have it. We intuited ahead, ahead of time something that we needed to hear. And I hope this is true for you too. What do you need to do? What, what do you want to gain in your life? And what do you need to gain that? And so don't let fear, don't let obstacles stop you. Go, go, go. Subscribe I to this. use that message. That's right. Thank you. Thank you to the ethers for dumping that one. It was perfect. This is your number one transformation conversation. Again, thank you for being with us. Do comment, do like, do subscribe, ding, ding, ding. And know that I read them all. This is your Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger podcast. Next week on the show, I am featuring the amazing Anita Serene, formerly known as Stargirl the Practical Witch. She's been a working psychic medium with a specialty in numerology, astrology, and mediumship. And we're going to be talking with Stargirl about how to predict the future with signs and omens. You're going to want to tune into that one. Thanks for joining us today. Thank